you are visiting with us, we want to welcome you to our services. And just pray God will bless all of you this morning. I hope, I hope he already has through the song service. Now we're going to look into the Word of God. If you'll take your Bibles and find the book of Joshua. We started a series through the book of Joshua. We have crossed the Jordan River with Joshua. We're in Canaan land, facing our first obstacle, which is the city, the walled city of Jericho. And everybody knows the story of Jericho. Walls came tumbling down, right? And uh, come back tonight, we're going to see the walls tumble down tonight in our evening service. But today we're going to look at how we need to get prepared to win these victories. It says in chapter 5, verse 1, It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, talking about the Mediterranean, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan River from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more, because of the children of Israel. Of God. See, these heathen nations in Canaan saw how powerful the God of Israel was. They'd heard about what he had done in Egypt, but that was 40 years ago. And now they've crossed that Jordan River. If you were here last Sunday, we talked about how God parted the waters. See, he not only did that at the Red Sea, he did that at the Jordan River too. And they crossed over on dry land into the land of Canaan. And all these Canaanite tribes have heard of this, and they were just totally demoralized by what they were hearing. Now you would think it would, it would be time to just attack, for the Israelites to just attack the Canaanites while they were in fear and in trembling. But instead, God commands them to remain at Gilgal and do several things to prepare them to conquer the land of Canaan. And what they're called upon to do really puts them at risk before their enemies. Now, the ways of God are strange sometimes, aren't they? I mean, I think we can admit that. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Sometimes we, we wonder about some of the things God is doing and what God wants us to do. One thing we got to remember, God never gets in a hurry. That bothers us sometimes, doesn't it? Because sometimes we're in a hurry, and God's not. And God wants us to be patient and to wait for Him. Remember that God's people are going to be engaged in battles as they enter the land of Canaan. But before they enter into these physical battles, there's some spiritual battles. There's some spiritual preparation that they had to make and that we have to make. Because you're going to face battles. And in your walk with Christ, in your, in your Christian life, there's some battles, there's some enemies that you're going to have to confront. So God's people... This, this goes far deeper than the physical realm. Before the battle begins in the physical realm, we have to look at the spiritual realm and make spiritual preparations. That's what this chapter is going to show us. What they needed to do back then, we need to do today. There are several steps here that I want to outline for you to help you. Are you ready to conquer your Canaan? We've talked about that. There is a Canaan land for you to conquer. You've got to cross the Jordan and enter in to this conflict. But understand this, God's going to fight the fight for you. If you will let him, if you will follow him, he will do the fighting for us. So we need to ask ourselves today whether or not we've taken care of these steps that he's outlined for Israel. So let's look at verse 2. First of all, you see that there's renewing their covenant with the Lord. They need to renew their covenant. This is the next generation. The old generation died out in the wilderness. The young ones that grew up in the wilderness, 
That's the new generation. And they need to renew a covenant with the Lord God Jehovah. And it deals with circumcision. And first of all, you see the sign of circumcision. Look at verse 2. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed, they died because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore to their fathers that he would give us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. Their parents had not done this during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now, the circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. It was the mark of that covenant. And for, these, for this new generation to go in under the blessing of God, they needed to enter into this covenant relationship that God had established. Therefore, they needed to take the mark of this covenant. What he's saying is we need to renew our covenant with God before we enter in. That we might have his blessings upon us as we deal with our enemies. So the sign of the covenant had to do with the Abrahamic covenant, sign of circumcision. What did it symbolize? What was the symbolism of circumcision? It tells us we need to remove from our lives anything that stands in the way of total surrender to the Lord. See, the Bible is clear that there are times when we engage in spiritual surgery. Write this verse down in your notes. Colossians 3, 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. There it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. The same idea of crucifying the old man, that you might put on the new man. To the Jew, circumcision was a reminder of that covenant that they were a marked people. Today it's baptism. Baptism is the identifying mark of the new covenant we enter into whereby Christ is the mediator. You identify with Christ and with his church through water baptism. We repudiate the old life that's buried in Christ. We rise up to walk in newness. Look over in Romans chapter 6. Let me show you what Paul says about this. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So here's the mark of the new covenant. We are to be baptized to identify with Christ after we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Now, the Jews began to look at circumcision as, as some kind of a sacrament that helped save them. When Jesus came along and dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they had corrupted this idea of circumcision and felt like that was necessary to salvation. Later on, you know, they were trying to get the Gentiles to do this. What's happened today? Same thing. 
Now you've got people that say baptism is necessary to salvation. It's not. You're not saved by being baptized. You're saved by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Say, so, well, then baptism is not important. Oh, I, it is important. Anything Christ tells you to do is important. Just because it doesn't save you and get you to heaven, if Christ says to do it, it's important. You don't get baptized to please me or Brother Matt. You get baptized to please the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that says, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. The uncircumcised members of Israel were in disobedience to God. The unbaptized believer is in disobedience to God. The first step of obedience is is to go to the waters of baptism and profess your faith in Jesus Christ openly. God never tells you to wait to do that. That is to be obedient immediately. So there's the symbol that is involved here. They were never to forget that they were the servants of the living God and under the obligation to obey Him in all things. Circumcision was to be the outward reminder of an inward work of faith. And the same is true of baptism. You might write this verse down. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Where he says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Some are stiff-necked in disobeying the written revelation of God. If you've been saved, you need to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. There may be some things that you need to cut off and put away that you might do that. Some of you, you might need to renew that covenant with the Lord today. Matter of fact, I think in the last month we've had eight professions of faith here. Eight people have accepted Christ as their Savior. We baptized four last Sunday. We've got some others that are awaiting baptism. And I praise God that people are getting saved and people are identifying with Christ and with His church and are not ashamed or embarrassed to take that step. Here's the second thing. Look at verse 8. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole, till they were healed. Here is a reaffirming their confidence in the Lord. Now think about this. They've crossed the Jordan River. They're now in the land of Canaan. And God tells them to circumcise all the men of war. And they are temporarily disabled and unable to fight. If the enemy should attack them at this point, they're in trouble. Because the men are sore, and they would not be able to defend themselves. So what they have to do here, they've got to trust the Lord to protect them during this time. God's got to protect them. Here is faith that must be installed. They must step out here in faith and obey God. Some of them might have wanted to argue and say, wait, we can't do this. I mean, we would be at the mercy of our enemies if we did this. That first generation would have thought that way. This new generation is ready to obey God. And they will do whatever the Lord tells them to do. Folks, faith is so important. We're going to face times of testing just like they did. And if we're going to enjoy the victory God has for us, we've always got to be willing to step out by faith and obey God's will. All through the Bible you see God taking care of His people. Noah was protected in the ark. The firstborn of Israel were spared when the death angel passed over Egypt. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel were all spared from evil kings. Folks, God will take care of his own. If you have faith in God, God will honor that faith. We're talking about having 200 next Sunday in Sunday school. 
staff, we talked about that. We set that goal. You know, we get up here and say that. We're kind of stepping out on faith. Because we could have egg all over our face next Sunday. If we have 150 in Sunday school, instead of the 200 we're shooting for, we're going to look foolish. A lot of times preachers, they, they're not willing to step out and, and make such claims and goals because they don't want to look foolish. But we're having faith here. I, I've, got, I've got a little, you ever see me back there marking off? I mark off who comes to church. And show it to Jesus every Monday. Me and Jesus have a little meeting. And I show him who's not here. As if he wouldn't know otherwise, right? No, I do that because I want to keep up. If people start missing, and in a, in a congregation this size, it would be easy not to notice when certain people start missing. When they start missing, I want to be able to follow up, call on them, make sure everything's okay. This week, as I was looking through that list, I just did a little count. I numbered the people. David did that once, didn't he? Of the people who attend here somewhat regularly, we have 270 members and children on that list. If they all came at the same time, we'd have 270 people, not counting the visitors. Now, you would think out of 270... We could get 200 of them to come to Sunday school. That's what I'm counting on. If you haven't been coming, I want you to come next Sunday, and I want you to bring somebody with you, and let's have a great day. Just have a rally day for the Lord next Sunday. And have a friend day that we'll remember. We're going to cross over Jordan and do that. Amen. Look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of this place is called Gilgal. Here is removing their condemnation by the Lord. He talks about the reproach of Egypt. We need a defining here of that reproach. What's he talking about? He names this place where they camp Gilgal because Gilgal means the reproach has been rolled away. That's what the word means. They named their camp Gilgal, right there by the Jordan River. And he's telling them that the reproach of the wilderness and the reproach of Egypt have been rolled away. God is no longer going to remember that. God's not going to hold them responsible for that. Leave that in the past and let's go forward. No, sometimes we've got to forget the past. Have you got the, some guilt about your past? Is there some things that you've done in your past that, that you have a hard time dealing with? First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Old things are past. All things are become new. Forget about those things in the past. The reproach of Egypt, the reproach of the wilderness. I think they're referring to two things here. When they came out of Egypt, remember the golden calf? That was a reproach. And then when they get to the Jordan River, that first generation will not go across, will not enter in because of lack of faith. That's a reproach. And he's telling this new generation, I am putting all that away. Forget about that and let's move forward. Now there may be some things in your past you just need to forget about. That guilt that is always there. You know the devil drums that up? The devil wants you to feel guilty about some things to keep you from serving the Lord as you should. The Lord says, I've rolled that away. I've forgiven that. I've forgotten that. I love that in the Bible, that God has forgotten. He not only forgives our sins, he forgets about them. Wouldn't it be awful when you get to heaven and you're walking along with Jesus and he says, you remember that horrible sin you committed back when you were 25? Wouldn't that be horrible? That's never going to happen. 
He's forgotten that. Now, your spouse won't forget it, but Christ has forgotten all the things you've done wrong. He'll never bring them up again. They forgot. He's rolled away the reproach so that we can go on in victory. Now look at verses 10 through 12. Here's remembering the commitment of the Lord. It says the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. First you see a table of remembrance. They once again kept the feast of Passover. If you remember when they were in Egypt, remember they were to take a Passover lamb and shed the blood and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes? And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Those who did not apply the blood, what happened? The firstborn of that house died. Throughout the land of Egypt, there was cries and wailing as people discovered a death. So God told the Israelites, from now on, on this date, every year, I want you to observe Passover, the Feast of Passover, to remember how God delivered you from bondage in Egypt and brought you to the Promised Land. So they had not kept that. For 40 years in a the wilderness, they had not once kept the Passover. But well, they really couldn't because they were uncircumcised. The uncircumcised could not partake of the Passover. Just like the unbaptized could not partake of the Lord's Supper. A lot of parallels there, isn't there? And so the Passover was renewed. And they were commanded to observe this holy day and remember what God had done for them. The Passover would be a time every year for the Israelites to remember how God had delivered them from bondage. That's what the Lord's Supper does, doesn't it? Every time we take the Lord's Supper, it's a memorial. And re we remember what Christ did to deliver us from bondage. When he died on the cross, his body broken, his blood shed, we remember the price that had to be paid for us to be saved. So there's a table of remembrance and a time of renewal. Remembering what God had done, facing the future, knowing that God is going to be with them. A time of renewal. And we face that today, don't we? They can remember what God had done for them. Can you remember what God has done for you? God called you in love. God saved you by His grace. God forgave your trespasses. God is keeping you from falling. God will conquer your enemies. God will give you victory in this life. That gives us courage to face whatever's coming. When Israel celebrated the Passover in Gilgal, folks, they did so right under the noses of their enemies. And we can show our remembrance of what Christ has done for us in a world that is hostile to Him. I'll never forget that that's an outward reminder of an inward work of faith. Amen. So remember the commitment that we have made. When we observe the Lord's Supper, I'm kind of glad in our church when we do observe the Lord's Supper, we usually have a pretty good turnout because we've taught our members, our members understand how important it is to be here when we observe the Lord's Supper. 
It's the church ordinance. We come together as a church family and we remember what Christ is. It's on that table right there. Do this in remembrance of me. So a preacher, I haven't observed the Lord's Supper in years. You're kind of like that bunch out of the wilderness, aren't you? They weren't observing what God had given them either. And I want to encourage you to do that. Passover reminded Israel that God had brought them out of Egypt. They had manna for 40 years in the wilderness. You notice that the manna ceased when they entered the land of Canaan. They could now partake of the fruit of the land, of the gardens and the vineyards and the orchards. They would receive that. They would no longer need the wilderness diet of manna. That ceased. You know, it's easy for God to bring his people out of Egypt. But you know, it's kind of hard to get Egypt out of some of his people. We get saved and we're to come out of the world and into the kingdom of God. Now, when you get saved, God's bringing you out of that world, but Sometimes we have a hard time getting the world out of you. That world is ingrained in a lot of people. They think that way. They act that way. They talk that way. They dress that way. And it should not be. There are too many believers today want to live like the, the Canaanites. But God has given you a different hunger. Not a hunger for the world. Don't, don't be hungry for the scraps of this world. That'll never satisfy you. You ought to have a hunger for the things of God. Manna is a type of Christ in the flesh. The manna came down as Christ came down from heaven. The corn of Canaan comes up out of the ground, which speaks of the risen Savior. We have that in Jesus Christ. Then in closing, look at the last three verses. Here we recognize the control of the Lord. It says in verse 13, It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. Nay, neither one. I'm not here to pick a side. I'm here to take the lead. He said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Kind of reminds you of Moses when he was on holy ground. When he came to that burning bush. When he comes to the burning bush, here the captain of the host is Jesus Christ. I don't believe that this is just a Gabriel or Michael or one of the angels because Joshua bows down and worships him. No angel would allow that to happen. The captain of the host allows it because the captain of the host is the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it says over in Hebrews 2.10, he is the captain of our salvation. Jesus did not come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. He is in charge. He is the great commander-in-chief, the head of the church. Folks, before you can have victory in this life, you must first be vanquished. You must surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Relinquish everything to Him. And follow Him, as we sang about this morning. Here's Joshua. He's looking at Jericho. He knows he's got to lead his people against this, this walled city. And we face the same thing. We face tests. We face battles. Is there unconfessed sin in your life? Better put it away. 
Are there worldly appetites in your life? You better put them away. Are you filled with doubt and fear? Is the Lord in control of your life? If you want victory in this life, there are certain things you better deal with. And follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Sam comes and we prepare for an invitation. There might be some of you, you're still in Egypt. Spiritually speaking, you're still in Egypt. You're still in bondage to sin and Satan. You've not been born again. You know, today could be your day of salvation. If you would come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ and let him redeem you, ready to follow him, you had that opportunity today.